Good evening, everyone. We are just letting everybody in, and we're also currently awaiting the arrival of our guest speaker, who hopefully will be with us shortly. That's uh, Path Patel. We have confirmed that he is joining us. So we'll let the participants uh, come in to the event, and hopefully, uh, when that's finished, Path will be will be with us. And um, as Andy McGregor has just done, feel free to uh, send greetings to people from the in the chat so we know who has joined us. And please put questions that you might want to pose uh, in the Q and A rather than in the chat. We'll just wait another minute or two. We have a good cross section of people from around the country. Okay, I think um, we will get underway um, with the good news that Path is is now online. Um, so I will give him a couple of seconds to, to draw breath and I will just introduce myself. So I'm Tom Brake, the director of Unlock Democracy. As hopefully many of you know, Unlock Democracy campaigns on a range of democratic reform issues with a particular focus on securing a written constitution for the United Kingdom, but also on other reform issues such as proportional representation, house laws reform, devolution, transparency and accountability of government. We are very, very fortunate uh, tonight to have Path Patel, who I'm sure uh, has a very, very busy party conference program. Um, and uh, he obviously here is here representing IPPR, who uh, produced fantastic work, fantastic research. And what Path is going to be talking about uh, tonight is uh, how to speak about democratic reform issues and certainly it's something that unlock democracy we are aware of uh, that sometimes the way of talking about democratic reform issues uh, isn't necessarily as productive as you uh, might expect it to be uh, in other words phrases such as uh, democracy is broken uh, is not effective whereas politics is broken uh, is something that people feel is very uh, a very strong association with. Anyway, that's enough for me. So we are very, very fortunate to have Path with us. And uh, Path, over to you. Thanks, Tom, um, and I'd like to mock you for having me here today. Sorry, I was a bit late. I was sat in a Teams call that I had clearly created on my own. I'm wondering, am I in the right link? But I wasn't in the right link. <laughs> um, uh, I've just seen a comment about, please explain IPPR. IPPR is the Institute for Public Policy Research, Judith, which is a progressive think tank based in Westminster, Manchester and Edinburgh. Um, I am in the Westminster office, which I'm speaking from today. We work across all sorts of policy issues, mainly domestic policy issues as an economic team, a social justice team and a democracy team, which is the one that I lead. Um, and they're all interlinked in, in ways you might expect. 
Um, so what I'm talking to today is a report we put out um, a few months ago called Talking Politics. It's the exam question of this report was essentially how you build public support for democratic reform, as Tom alluded to earlier. The language we sometimes use is counterintuitive at times. There's no clear way of actually knowing how we can mobilize public support around. And that's important, right? The point of democratic reform is to make democracy more democratic, right? More responsive to people, to have pe to people have greater representation in the choices we make as a whole. Um, and as a result, we need quite a big buy-in to reforms to our constitution, our collective constitution. It's quite odd, I think, to say, oh, we can just do this and not take the public with us. That doesn't work. That doesn't lead to long-term entrenched change. So we both need to move voters and we also need to get legitimacy from people up and down the country for ways to reform of our democracy. And that broadly involves politicians talking about this. So I've got a few slides. I'll run through them quite quickly, I think maybe about 10 minutes or so, um, and then we can have a sort of a more free-flowing informal conversation with um, people on this call. That sounds good. Um, here we are. Cool. Um, can everyone see that? Yeah, okay, fine. All right, so I mean, this is the, the first point and it won't come as a surprise that people sort of everywhere in this country sense that democracy isn't quite working as it should and that's particularly sharpened in recent years this sort of period that people have now started calling the age of insecurity um, what do i mean by that sort of the first time since the industrial revolution the first time since the birth of democracy actually in this country that people don't expect their children to be better off than them continents once again at war planets on fire we don't know if there's going to be a doctor or a copper there when we need them. Wages are falling after flatlining for years. You know, that's the age of insecurity. We see some politicians now talking about this and using this frame here in the UK, but also in other countries, of course. Um, and so in this period, we really, people start to sense whatever this democracy machine thing is, it's not really working because I'm not really doing anything. And maybe some people are getting her off, but it's definitely not me, right? And that's completely affected our view of politicians. It's not helped by the fact that our politicians are also then in involved in scandals, party gay, or lobbying scandals, and other sorts of things which have affected this. So broadly speaking, we can see from this chart, most people just think politicians are out for themselves, and it's been getting worse over time and really fallen off a precipice in recent years. Related, but not quite the same thing, is trust in our collective political institutions. Uh, so this is looking at parliament. Um, and the question here is, like, to what extent do you trust parliament to act in the best interests of people in the UK? That's the fundamental, primary, number one purpose of parliament, right? People we elect to make decisions are in our best interest, right? In this country and in most other democracies, we don't get to choose the decisions, we get to choose the decision makers. That's how democracy works, right? Like or loathe, that's broadly how it works. So how, how much do we trust these decision makers? And like, there's two things from this chart. Pretty much no one trusts them that much. You don't, we don't hit even the 50% line on this chart. In fact, the access doesn't even get up to 50%. So wherever you are, depending on sort of the social distribution of this country, no one really thinks parliament is acting in the best interest of people in this country, but there's also a clear divide. People who haven't been to university and people on lower incomes are less likely to trust Parliament to act in their interests. So that's just kind of setting the scene. I think none of that will be that surprising. You've seen maybe not the same charts, but similar charts. Um, but it's highlighting that there is really a problem here and people think there's a problem uh, with how democracy is working. And therefore, or not therefore, but at the same time, people think there's a, there is an overwhelming support to reform the democratic system. The democracy isn't working, we need to do something about the machine that we call democracy. Um, what exactly? I don't know, we can come on to that. But people broadly agree that we need to rewire our democracy, right? This chart on the top left is something we did, we polled 8,000 people um, in the UK, so it's quite a big sample. And we asked them to what extent do you think the sort of political system in this country needs reforming? Nine out of 10 said it needs some kind of reform, right? So that's nine out of 10 people in this country think we need to rewire the way democracy works. So there's a big sort of public, there's a well there, a public appetite to reform our democracy. This is a quote from a focus group we ran. This quote in particular is from Hartlepool and someone just said the only way to describe it is broken. Um, and the chart on the right, it's not a chart, it's a graph, um, is off, it's a constituency map, essentially. We ran a fancy kind of analysis with loads of mathematical words in it, but basically lets you take a big sample of a poll in the country and then map it onto what does it look, what does it mean from a constituency basis? Um, and the red means there's stronger support for more radical democratic reform. And you can see that the red is concentrated particularly in the former industrial heartlands of um, 
Great Britain, right? Particularly the Red Wall area, which is obviously a big swing seat area, but other parts that were formerly industrialized that no longer are. So that's also just quite an interesting thing to point out. So people in general sense that democracy isn't working as it should, and people in general think the political system or democracy needs reforming. But appetite for democratic reform is not the same as activation, right? You don't just be like, oh, loads of people want democratic reform and therefore we get democratic reform. It doesn't work like that. That last step requires a politician or, a pol or politicians to essentially take this agenda, grab it by its horns and say, right, we're going to do something. It requires politicians to mobilize support, right? The best example of this is Brexit, right? General sort of, in, in fact, there wasn't even that strong of an appetite for the reform, right? There was a reasonable part of the population that wanted to leave the EU, but a politician grabbed it and actually increased it. They mobilized and activated that support. So that's the kind of thing we're saying. That was a democratic reform. It's not one that I thought was particularly uh, beneficial to this country, but it was a democratic reform, right? So I think the question here for progressives, or at least progressive think tanks like IPPR, is like, can, how do we do this around issues we care about? Whether it's electoral reform or House of Laws reform or devolution, you name it, how do we mobilize people around these issues? So politicians have two questions, right? To mobilize support for democratic reform. They have a what question. What are the right reforms? I'm just going to pin that. This report does not look into that, but we, I'm sure the conversation will get into that. Um, and I'm writing a report currently that is trying to answer that question. Um, and then there's a how question. How do we actually mobilize voters? And that's the focus of this report, because it's a question that's generally neglected. If we don't know how we actually get people excited or interested in democratic reform to bring democratic reform to the fore of the debate, then we're always going to lose, regardless of what we think the right reform is, right? We can debate or not what the right, I don't know, composition of the House of Lords should be, but there's a way to talk about it that gets you legitimacy over it, and you need that legitimacy if you're going to enact this reform. So there are a few, there are various different ways to frame the need for democratic reform. We ran focus groups in Hartlepool, in the north of Birmingham, in High Peak, um, in Sheffield, and in Winchester. So it's sort of quite different seats, basically, um, constituencies, those were. Um, and we spoke to people there and we asked trying to unpack, sort of go below that, that, that layer below the top line that the polling tells you, right? Everyone, the polling says you don't trust parliament, you don't trust our political institutions, you think you're just with democracy. The focus groups that you take, okay, well, why? Right. So we asked them why and we talked through that and we talked through that. And sort of a few things came up. Um, some quotes here from some people, participants we spoke to. Um, but in general, there were sort of various ways to frame it. But these are the four that we felt were the, the strongest, that came out the most obvious, and the four quite distinct ways to talk about the need for democratic reform. And that's what they hear. I'm not going to read them out for you, but one is about democracy is sort of dominated by the elite. It's kind of rigged. It's the populist line, essentially, right? It's people versus the elite. Anyone who watched Suella Braverman's speech yesterday, day before yesterday, saw like a perfect example of that kind of mobilization. Um, ironically, it was exactly the same Shelley thing she quoted that Jeremy Corbyn once said at a conference speech a few years ago. It's not ironic at all, actually. Um, delivery is talking about democratic reform as a means to make policy decisions more responsive to what people want and what is in their material interests, right? So you can talk about public services or cost of living or the fact that governments over the past 40 years uh, have redistributed less, right? So economic inequality has grown, why is that possible in a democracy kind of question? So it's about delivering policy outcomes that feel more responsive to what people think they need. That's a delivery aspect. Integrity is a belief that politicians don't act with integrity. They're able to do things and get away with it, things that normal people wouldn't be able to get away with. Like normal people would get fired from their job for doing things like sexual harassment, but some MPs can get away with that. Um, and of course that kind of relates a lot to the Boris Johnson premiership and what went on there with the various scandals. Um, and representation is a slightly different frame, which is that parliament doesn't look like us, you know, they're all private school, Oxbridge educated elites, and therefore they don't really represent the society. So how could they govern and act in society's interests? So those are four different frames that we came up with based on the focus groups we ran. Um, and then the report goes on to essentially test how powerful these different frames are as ways to talk about political reform, ways to talk about democratic reform, widely defined, right? So all the kind of things that you might think of democratic reform, voting system reform, house of laws, devolution, we tested all that and framed them all through, through these four things. Um, I'll quickly share a couple of the main findings. 
So the, this slide essentially shows how, if you're exposed to a frame, um, and essentially, hypothetically, the person looking at the, the survey is our, showed, like, imagine a politician says this, and it's framed in a particular way. Does it make you support the need for democratic reform, more or less? And basically, any politician talking about democratic reform broadly increases support for it, right? It doesn't matter what the frame is, but if you're a politician, you're saying democracy needs reforming for X reason, and here are some reforms that it might involve. People are like, oh, yeah, actually, broadly agree democratic reform. This country needs reform. Salience is a different thing. It's not testing how much you support reform. It's just testing how important you think democratic reform is relative to other things. You know, how important is it relative to school reform or getting an NHS waiting list down, that kind of thing. Um, and we see some differences here. The frame that did the best is the delivery one, right? So when you talk about democratic reform as a way to make policy more responsive to what people need, then people are like, actually, yeah, this is actually pretty damn important rather than it's some other issue. But that's one thing that came up. We also tested what it might mean for voting behavior. So again, people answering this survey experiment, they all, not everyone is, everyone's only shown one frame, by the way, of these 8,000 people, I should have clarified, they're separated into groups, a bit like a trial, um, and they're given, and in a trial, one group is given one drug, one group is given another drug, one group is given a placebo. That's exactly how we ran this, the control group is the placebo. Um, and then we saw sort of what effect it has, I should have clarified that. So it's essentially inspired by that kind of approach that we use in medicine. And this is voting behavior. So this is, again, imagine a political party were to go really quite big on political reform, right? The Liberal Democrats, a good example of this. This is a big issue for them. And we're going to talk about it a lot. Does that make you more or less likely to vote for the party? And he said, so compared to the control groups, a party who doesn't talk about democratic reform, it's not something that we care about. If you are a party who does talk about it, regardless of how you frame it, you are going to get a, a few more votes. But there are some frames that do better than others, particularly the delivery frame, and the elite capture frame. They mean quite different things. The elite capture frame is not available to all popular all politicians, right? You can imagine Suella Braverman saying it, but it's much harder for Sunak or even Starmer to, or Ed Davey to use that line, right? Because they're not populist politicians, even if they one of them might try to be. They're not, they don't naturally get that. And the delivery, however, is a lot more accessible to mainstream politicians. So it's quite interesting. If you do frame it in that delivery mode, that actually had the biggest effect in terms of affecting people's self-reported voting behavior. The, um, the, the other two bars are lighter shaded because we didn't find a statistical difference. So it looks like it maybe has some effect. We can't be confident that that result is, is, is true, right? There's at least a 5% chance that what we're seeing there is due to chance. So therefore we're not saying we think that makes a difference. Um, did different ways to frame them, the need for democratic reform, did that affect people's attitudes and values in, in how they see democracy, these are kind of things that people are free to express their, their political views openly, or all citizens should have equal political rights, or people are willing to listen to and respect each other's point of views. These kind of things that make up a democratic culture or our democratic institutions, these kind of core values, basically don't change. Regardless of how you're framing it, they're deeply set. You can't really affect that. People have these or they don't have these. It's not, politicians don't have the power to change that, which again might not be surprising, but it's interesting to see that and it's worth reiterating right we can't change certain things which are more fundamental or deeper down in the composition of an individual and how they see the world and then i think this is the last thing that i've got up here which is how does exposure to these different ways of framing the need for democratic reform affect an individual support for a particular policy so the chart on the left is support to replace the first past the post voting system with a proportional voting system now talking about democratic reform across the elite capture representation delivery frames increases support for that. The delivery frame, I think it's like surprisingly, at least for me, had the biggest effect there. So if you talk about, we're going to change the electoral system. So therefore, what we can do is actually just get on with it and deliver better policies without all this bickering or whatever it is you want to talk about. That looks like it actually had a slightly bigger effect than the representation angle, which I thought maybe it was more natural. So well, actually, if we change the electoral system, you get sort of a greater voice. And then the chart on the right at the top is about House of Lords, and the chart at the bottom of the right is about devolution. And again, you see elite capture and delivery are the frames that do the most. The gray bars are not statistically significant, so generally just I would suggest ignoring them for now, unless you're statistically trained and can interpret that. Um, but the thing here is, again, delivery broadly does slightly better than the rest. And in this kind of survey experiment, marginal 1-2% differences actually are kind of what the, the thing we're expecting. So some of these changes are actually quite big. 
Um, actually, I think I have one last slide. So what we did, the final thing is all of these things are useful, but what we're interested in is like kind of overall, not these kind of piecemeal, what does it mean for voting behavior? What does it mean for attitudes? What does it mean for policy positions? What does it mean for salience? What does it mean for support? Actually, we wanted index. So we worked with some clever mathematicians to try and work out a good way to develop an index. And even that kind of goes over my head and I'm statistically trained, but there is a way and I can share the details of essentially how that index was developed um, based on groupings of certain things. And over here, as you might have expected based on the previous charts, overall, the delivery frame was the most powerful way to build public support for democratic renewal. And so that was the conclusion we came to. It's not to say other frames are ineffective. They all clearly had some effect, but delivery was the most effective one. And it's worth bearing in mind, it's accessible to mainstream politicians in a way that frames around elite capture are not. Um, I'll, well, that is the end of me. So I probably rambled on for a bit too long, haven't I, Tom? So why don't I stop? No, that, that's perfect. Thank you very much, Path. Um, I, I'll just ask a couple of questions then we'll throw it open to uh, to the wider audience. So do put your questions in the Q&A. I suppose my first question is around the, the delivery frame and so in other words, uh, showing that democratic reforms uh, will lead to better social and economic uh, conditions. I think my question would be, in the work that you were doing, were you simply saying that um, those democratic, democratic reforms would lead to better social and economic conditions, or were you explaining why those democratic reforms would lead to it? Or were people just taking it at face value that that would be the consequence? And so it's the latter, the second of what you said. So we the, the text of the frame, which is again, it's at the bottom of the report. If, um, if you haven't seen the report, you can very welcome to go have a look at it, but essentially sets up the case for democratic reforms. So, so government should be working on our behalf, but they're basically not. Politicians promise the earth, they don't seem to deliver like politics, et cetera. And then it's like, if Britain is going to change, British politics has to change. Therefore, we need to sort of repair our democracy. But it's it's not saying democratic reform will lead to better social outcomes, will lead to better public services. It's more of the public services aren't great. We seem to never get things that we want. And therefore, we need political reform. All right. Um, one other question before I, I throw it open, and that is, um, do you think that the most recent pronouncements from Rishi Sunak about um, the you know politics being broken, the system not working? I mean, is he has he been picking up on your your polling? Do you think? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, that's a good question, uh, and I did notice some interesting things in his speech where he essentially alluded to to some of this. I don't know if he's picked up on our polling specifically, but I suspect some of their pollsters and their focus groups have come up with the same thing, right? People in this country are pretty fed up with elites. There's lots that divides Britons, but the one thing that essentially unites everyone is broadly a distaste for Westminster, right? People have kind of had enough of paying for the mistakes of elites or who they perceive to be the elites. Um, and that essentially demands democratic reform. And so I think what Sunak is trying there is saying, right, look, I get you, you're fed up. It's not working, but then it's almost non sequitur to see what the what the offer is as a response, right? The offer has to be some kind of constitutional, democratic, or political reform. It has to be that. It can't just be I'm picking a different policy, right? It can't be a different policy prescription without changing how policy is made tomorrow. And I don't think Sunak's quite got that. But I think the problem definition or the polling is starting from might well be the same thing. Okay. So I'm now going to go into questions. So as I said, I do encourage people to add in and um, uh, their own questions into the Q&A. And although you've gone into a bit more detail about the delivery frame, D dear Linda, I don't know if you've seen her question, uh, would like you to explain in a bit more detail so that I think everyone knows how to use that frame in the conversations they're having. Right, I think, so, I mean, I can try and paste the exact text, or maybe you can have a look on the internet. But the, the broad argument of the delivery frame is that politicians seem to always make quite big promises, but they never seem to deliver them, right? We essentially have something in our system that incentivizes short-term sticking plasters over actual solutions. 
And therefore, it's no wonder that NHS waiting lists are so long or the price of everything is going up or that wages have stood still for most people for a decade and now for those very same people are falling. And therefore, if we're going to have a better Britain, we need to have a different kind of politics. We need to sort of do X, Y, Z or in terms of your political reforms to repair our democracy. That's the delivery frame. Hopefully that's a bit clearer. Great, thank you. I'm now going to move to one of um, Marisha Ray's questions. And that's it. And, and I don't know whether you, uh, perhaps through previous research or through this research, whether that's a, a question that you've addressed. And that is whether the, uh, would the public support direct democracy more than a representative democracy, given that they think their representatives aren't acting in good faith? Yeah, Do you have any that's... evidence on that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the, uh, I, the, uh, the evidence here is difficult because I'm entirely sceptical of someone polling this question. It's like, should we have more referendums? There's actually quite a lot of support for that. But that doesn't tell you very much. Like, polling in general is like, is, is Delphic, right? It tells you something. It tells you the question you answer, asked, but it doesn't tell you what to do, right? So just because you ask a question, like, do you want more referendums? People say, yeah, doesn't mean you should have more referendums. That's not the same thing. That is a very different kind of kettle of fish. And you have to take a lot more questions there about what's actually the democratic need. The fact that people do want or support modes of democracy that aren't the traditional representative democracy tells us that representative democracy has ceased to be representative. That's what it tells us, right? There's something wrong with the current system of representative democracy that isn't leading for people to feel represented in a collective political institution. And that's partly about the decisions that are being made that aren't improving people's lives, that delivery aspect. It's partly about looking at politicians and just thinking they're all out of touch elites. Um, it's all of these things together. And the solution to that is partly reforming the existing representative democracy, as well as finding new modes to connect citizens to policies that might not go through MPs, or might not go through a politician. So you can go directly to policy, whether it's direct democracy, solutions of deliberation, referendums, and so on. That's all part of the solution too. But I'm very wary of saying that something is a silver bullet. There is no silver bullet. It's kind of working through all these things such that people feel they have greater sense of the policy, sense of influence over the policy making process. That's sort of the key thing. Okay, thank you. Um, sort of a, a related question about representative democracy from Susan Kendrick, and I'll, I'll wrap up um, uh, Richard Kelsall's question in there as well. Um, and Susan's question was, uh, three of the UK nations elect their devolved governments using forms of proportional representation. Has this had any identifiable effect on delivery? Uh, Richard's question is about what electoral system was in place in Germany and Italy in the 1930s. And I suspect the answer to that was possibly some form of proportional representation. But I, I think that uh, either you can address that. Um, Ask that particular question, or or, or I will address uh, Richard's response. So, in relation to, to Susan's question about is there any evidence that uh, proportional representation of governments, uh, where there is proportional representation, are more uh, effective at delivering? Yeah. Okay. So that's a good question. I'm going to take it in two parts. First, I'm going to talk about the devolved assemblies, um, of which. To the best of my knowledge, I am not aware of much study of that. That's rigorous enough. And then I will talk more broadly about the link between proportional representation and policy outcomes, of which there is tons of literature, um, but it's not split restricted to those devolved countries. So um, devolved assemblies PR, yes. And that was sort of obviously one big legacy of new labor. Um, essentially, it's been from the, again, to the best of my knowledge, this may well be out there, but I haven't found a convincing analysis, let alone a study that shows very much to do with the association of the devolved assembly's electoral system and sort of their policy outcomes and who benefits. That's partly because the causal sort of picture is really messy, right? Devolved assemblies have some powers, but not all powers. You already have to restrict yourself to certain policy domains. And then even within, they're kind of limited by the budgets that are handed down from Westminster. So there's already lots of other things that could be going on here as to why, for example, the Scottish government has not managed to get drug debts down yet, right? Some of that is to do with the powers they have. Um, they've obviously got some new policies recently, but the consumption room, we'll just have to see what happens there. But broadly speaking, I suspect these studies will come over time, 
and they will look at what's going on in Scotland and in Wales and in Stormont and work out whether we think it's made a difference or not. Uh, but it's going to be hard because they still ha don't have the same powers as Westminster. More generally, there is a ton of evidence about electoral institutions and policy outcomes. And there's kind of two things that come out in terms of do PR systems lead to a different kind of policy? And the answer is yes. It leads, certainly in economic policy, to greater redistribution. So a fairer eco income distribution at the least, and the tax and transfer policy changes that come with a PR system are quite well evidenced. Um, exactly why that happens is a little bit more tenuous. Is it about different parties forming government, or is it about the choices that people make regardless of the party and government? That it gets a bit complicated, but we do know for sure that you have essentially a fairer distribution of income because of active government policy in terms of tax and transfer under PR systems. I can say that. So that's already quite interesting. Uh, and that would count, in, broadly speaking, the way we would define it as better delivery, because it's delivering policy that is more responsive to the interests of most people, right? their material interests. Um, and there is another, there is a smaller literature on like cultural issues like immigration policy and so on. Um, I don't know that literature so well, so I'm not going to comment on it. But if you drop me an email, I can try and formulate a more thoughtful response to that after I've had a read over that over the next few weeks. Um, Tom, I'll leave the Germany question to you because you seem like talk about this maybe and you want to <laughs> come back on well, um that's just before coming to that um it, it, there as i understand it uh, and again it's hard to demonstrate a correlation uh, there is uh evidence that countries with proportional systems tend to be healthier mm. and certainly there there are arguments again which um hard to, to to prove cause and effect but they also tend to be firmer towards, for instance, climate change policy in terms of, of tackling it. I don't know if you've got any evidence that would support those two, uh, two positions. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've heard both of those things before, and I think um, that I, I essentially agree. Um, I think the other thing that's worth saying is also trust in political institutions is higher in PR systems. In the PR countries that have a PR electoral system, people are generally more like to trust politicians, trust parties, trust democratic institutions. That's also something that we can see. Sure, thank you. Uh, so just in terms of Richard's question, now I don't know whether there is anyone on, on the call, by all means, put it in the chat if you know exactly which electoral systems were in place in Germany and Italy in the 1930s, but I suspect uh, that the answer may be a proportional uh, system. Um, I mean, just quickly looking at the, the elections in 1933, I think um, uh, Hitler's party got, I think at that point, just over 40% of the vote, uh, which uh, had Germany had a first past the post system, I suspect would have given him uh, a very significant majority in that, uh, in that parliament. So I don't think that if the point is PR can sometimes lead to very dangerous governments, uh, I think that is equally true of first past the post, and I don't think there's anything intrinsically about any political system that is necessarily going to guarantee that out of that system, uh, very, very unpalatable governments uh, could emerge. But um, if anyone wants to, to expand on that in the chat, then please, uh, please feel free uh, to do so. Um, going to some of the other questions that we've got. Um, Let's take the question from uh, GT. Uh, democratic reform has to go hand in hand with reform of party finances. Uh, are people interested in that? Have you done any polling on that path that would confirm people are interested? And if, if you have done, how should we talk about it? Excellent question, um, because I, um, I'm currently writing a report on exactly this, money and politics in British politics, and that will come out on the 1st of November or in that week. So keep eyes peeled for that. Um, so with party financing, I include in the broad umbrella of democratic reform. So when I say democratic reform, that very much includes all the money and politics bucket and below. So party financing, political donations, MP second jobs, all that sort of stuff is really important. And that's very much part of democratic reform in my view, at least. And I think broadly the sector agrees with that. Um, what's the, what's the, what the, remind me of the question, Tom, what was it in terms of, What's the best way to talk about it? Or was it what's going on there? 
Yes, I mean, whether there's any evidence that people are interested in the issue, but also if they are, how do we best talk about it in terms yeah. of a, a framing around the issue? Yeah, there was, it came up quite naturally in quite a few of our focus groups. People sort of went to party financing and money and politics and corruption in that sense. And they use the word corruption quite a lot, which surprised me. Corruption sort of meant a lot of things. It didn't always mean financial stuff, but it did come up quite a lot. So I think people are aware of that. Um it's a pressing concern for beyond just do the public care about this because, so I'm quoting work from Julia Caget here, it will be in the upcoming IPPR report, but essentially the relationship between campaign spending and vote share at the constituency level for parliamentary elections has increased. It used to be like this, and over the past 10 years, it's gotten stronger. And I've seen there's another question here from Dina Barry about campaign financing. So that's quite worrying, right? We hear about this debate a lot in the US. No one really talks about it here because we've got spending rules and all that sort of stuff. But there's ways to get around it, essentially. And the fact that the relationship, the strength of the relationship between how much you spend in your constituency and how many votes you're going to get um, at the general election has strengthened, that's pretty worrying. Right. So that makes it even more pressing that we think about this question um, in terms of framing it. I would the research that we're doing here suggests that you would still frame it through the delivery frame. Right. So you would say this is important because when we have this kind of importance of money in politics, it leads to very certain types of people entering politics and certain types of people getting blocked out. So then we get a more limited view of people in parliament who can who act in their own interests, an individual's view of the world shapes their decisions, right? So if you need a certain amount of money to be an MP, the people who don't end up becoming MPs are the people who didn't go to university, the people who aren't lower incomes or work certain types of jobs. And we want more of those kinds of people because they make decisions that represent people more fairly. So I think that's kind of the reason you would do, and you would again bring that down to delivery on behalf of people like yourself. Um, that's kind of why I would suggest the research implies there are obviously different ways to talk about party financing, um, and you can very much go down the populist elite capture route as well, um, but that's not the one that we're sort of suggesting that you would, and there is certainly a way you can frame it around delivering more responsive policy. And again, the report I'm writing is essentially about policy responsiveness. Why is it that policy is more responsive to some groups rather than others, um, of which one dimension is about party financing? So I'm happy to share more about that closer to the top. And to part of the, just so that people know, Unlock Democracy's policy on the issue is that no one, whether it's a company or a private indi individual, should be able to contribute more than £5,000 per annum uh, towards a political party. And the point Path is making about um, the, the spending in constituencies is that there are two pots of money that um, parties can spend money from. One in a constituency that is uh, for, for campaign literature, for instance, that is mentions the candidate, which is very restricted in terms of how much can be spent, roughly £15,000 in the last four weeks of the campaign. But the parties can spend nationally on material that doesn't feature a party candidate's name, uh, tens of millions of pounds. So what parties tend to do is spend a very significant chunk of that tens of millions of pounds in the hundred or so marginal seats, uh, so that the uh, basically uh, tweaking the system uh, to their political advantage to try to secure victory in the the hundred seats or so that are ones that are very heavily fought over. Uh, while broadly speaking, the rest of the seats are are completely neglected. We've got a question from Pete Collins, which is close to our hearts in terms of um, do you think that the seemingly spontaneous rise in the status of citizens' assemblies uh, is on the right track? Yeah, Have great. Have polling on that? Great question. Great question. Um, so, I mean, I think it's a complicated question, essentially. I think citizens' assemblies are really interesting. Um, and I think they have clear value to add to the policy making process, the democratic policy making process. The question is um, where and what kind of value, right? And I think essentially they're a way to get greater input from civil society into the policy making process. That's partly a response because or to that the older relationship between civil society and the policy making process 
has deteriorated. That older process is the political party, right? The political party has traditionally been the vehicle to connect civil society to policy and get their input across and essentially develop policy bottom up. For various reasons across various democracies, parties have become a lot worse at doing that. Um, citizens' assemblies are one approach to getting around that. So, so we still have these things, um, but we have other ways to be making decisions, whether it's agenda setting or decision making, they're important. So I'm broadly supportive of citizens' assemblies are they popular? The polling we've got is kind of not conclusive. It sort of says, yeah, they're broadly popular, um, but they're not like, oh my God, this is the one thing we need. Different people have found different things. Um, and like I said with my point earlier, the polling is useful to answer the question you want. It's just not the same thing as telling you what to do. The decision about whether or not we should institutionalize citizens' assemblies or standing assemblies should not be based on a poll. It should be based on much deeper thought than that. My position is that, yes, we should essentially find a way to bring more citizens' assemblies into policymaking, particularly when it's a tricky policy issue where there are clear trade-offs. Um, and that doesn't just have to be in policymaking for the state. It could also be in smaller things like a hospital might decide to do it or a health board saying, should we fund the local IVF service or should we fund the local sickle cell service, right? We've only got a certain amount of money. And that's obviously a pretty not clear example. That doesn't actually happen like that. But using a citizen's assembly to help deliberate about questions like that is good. Um, do our citizens' assembly a silver bullet? No, and I think sometimes they're seen as that. They're seen as, well, let's just do this and that will fix everything. They are an adjunct, not an alternative to representative democracy. All the problems that were happening to political parties still need fixing. We can't just do citizens' assemblies and say, all well, the rest of the stuff doesn't matter. It doesn't work like that, in my opinion. I think they're useful, but you still have to do all the other stuff. Well, I think one critical thing about citizens' assemblies is that if the government doesn't buy into them at the beginning of the process, I, I, I think it it can be both frustrating for those who take part in the citizens' assembly, but also um, starts to damage the uh, the concept if mm. people participate in an event uh, only to find that government uh, chooses not to listen to any of their recommendations. So you, you need buy-in. If we can quickly go back to the question of um, PR, uh, and that's a question from Alistair Thomas. Uh, how do we get past the problem that, uh, I mean, Turkey's voting for Christmas, I think, is this question. That first pass the post with its safe seats directly benefits the incumbents, uh, whereas PR would threaten their safe and comfortable positions. So that's more of a political question, I guess. So I don't know whether you, you want to ask a political question or whether the polling has anything to say on this matter. Yeah, I mean, I think that is, that's a political strategy question, right? And it's something that I won't have that much of an insight for. Um, I mean, not all PR systems are equal, right? In some ways, you have a lot of incumbents losing their seats. And in some systems, a lot of them can keep their seats. Um, it sort of depends on the route you pursue. There's always strategic talk about why don't we just go for a top up and then have a massive parliament and then work that out later. I kind of everyone, or we not go fully proportional, we'll get a bit more proportional. They're all slightly different approaches. This question about how many incumbents will lose their seat is basically a big one. You never, as hard as the road to PR is, this is going to be a big barrier in it. Um, and so political strategists will certainly be thinking about this. How can we minimize certain people losing their seats so therefore they're more likely to support this? I think that's it. But I don't have the answer to that. It's not the kind of work um, I do. Um, I just had one more thought, at least on citizen assemblies, that I think is worth flagging. So great as they are, one, and in a key part of democracy is like the mass element. Popular democracy has to be popular, has to be basically everyone. And the thing with citizen assemblies is not basically everyone, right? So as useful as they are as understanding civil society, it's never going to be everyone in civil society participating. And that's an important limitation to them. Great. Thank you. Um, moving on then, we've now got a question from uh, Vicky Stedden, uh, who's very active in Sheffield. So following the Race, race Equality Commission's report from last year, and they're seeking to reach out to ethnic minority communities through their various organisations to see if we can identify democratic issues they're particularly concerned about and then how to work with them. Uh, does your polling or your uh, or any other uh, sort of polling that you've done recently uh, point to uh, whether there are distinct issues, democratic issues that uh, resonate more, effect uh, more loudly with ethnic minority communities? Yeah, it's a good question. Not in this paper. We we couldn't, we essentially didn't observe any, many differences between the minority ethnic groups in, in this paper, which was testing different ways to frame democratic reform. 
There are, of course, quite strong differences in how different minority ethnic communities view the state and interact in British democracy, right? The, your sort of view on trust of the state is very much shaped by your experiences of it. It's like policy is quite important, how the welfare state has affected you or not affected you, those kind of things really affect how you view the state. And some minority ethnic communities have certainly been, I guess, privy to sort of disproportionate or dis of disproportionate impacts from state policy. Um, my hostile environment is quite a good example of that, right? It was about immigrants, but actually affected lots of non-immigrant people who had a right to stay here and discriminated against it and so on. So that kind of stuff all makes a big difference. Um, but, and I think it's a really important question to be asking, but I don't have an answer in terms of how, if there's essentially a different way to frame democratic reform to minority ethnic communities, I think it's a really excellent question um, and one that basically I'll take back and see if I can integrate it into future work. Okay, that would be really helpful for us as an organisation, uh, as we're trying to reach out more effectively uh, than we've done so far. So any work done on that would be uh, very gratefully received. Um, a sort of question about um, structures, which again may not be something that's come up come up in your your research. So structures of of the way structures influence uh, debate. So in other words, the way. Uh, our House of Commons chamber is structured. Uh, any ideas about how to, to to use design to make our system more consensual, I think, is, yeah. is behind that question. Yeah, I like that question. I've heard it a few times. It's really not something I research much about, so I can only really sort of speak back to you what I think you've probably already read, which is that the answer is yes. <laughs> there are obviously ways to sort of design a chamber that is less sort of fighty and acrimonious and more consensual um, in its way and its tone of debate and culture. And part of that is to do with the culture of politics that and the people who become politicians. Part of that is about the chamber and the design and that all makes a difference too. I know there's some people have written reports about this. There's obviously the example of the German Bundestag and how that was built for transparency and the way it's all done. I think it's very interesting, but I don't know enough about it. The minority ethnic thing I wanted to come back to because I had one more thought basically which is the democratic dissatisfaction and trust can be lower in these communities. And we also know turnout rate in um, at elections is broadly lower for minority ethnic people um, who might also be disproportionately um, sort of affected by recent changes to the voter ID stuff. Um, but what I wanted to say is that it's hard also to tease apart what is to do with ethnicity and what is to do with where you live, right? Because minority ethnic communities in this country disproportionately live in cities. Um, it's like... 90 to 95 percent of them live in cities compared to 70 to 75 percent of white British people so that already massively affects the voice they have in a first past the post system so that's already that could if, for example you just reform that maybe you see that gap between minority ethnic and non and white British communities dissolve because actually everyone in cities feels like they've got a louder voice because they're not just all living in safe seats so that's also worth bearing in mind as well as the thing I said about sort of how policy affects you and your interactions with the state I think that's too valid as well well, just one thing to mention in terms of the chamber, at the point when Parliament was discussing uh, the, the, the rebuild of the Palace of Westminster, uh, there was a proposal at that time of creating a, uh, a second or a, a, a replica chamber for the House of Commons that could be used, uh, that would have been in, in the nor on the northern part of the estate, and that had it gone ahead would have provided an opportunity potentially to, to have that replica chamber uh, as a sort of uh, semicircle as opposed to uh, the you know the, the, the two swords length apart approach that we have currently but um, as people have picked up the restoration and renewal project seems to have died a death uh, which is uh, quite risky given the risk of the Palace of Westminster catching fire um, but um, anyway, hopefully some action will be taken on that soon. Um, someone has helpfully uh, watched at me to say that by the 1930s, uh, Italy had a one-party state. So that, that's the answer to the question, certainly in relation to Italy. Um, now, moving to a question from uh, John Lynch. He says, we're used to politics being presented as a binary framing, e.g. left versus right, the rich versus poor. But are we now, in fact, in a framing which is actually about a radical uh, versus a reactionary binary cleft? Do you have any views on on that path? 
Yeah, um, I don't think I quite understand the reactionary versus radical, but I think, I mean, this is obviously a reference to the sort of the current state of politics and sort of what we, what's going on um, with sort of the Tory party and sort of potential reinvention is, is I think that's what, how I interpret it at least. Um, and how has the axis of political competition changed? I think, I think it's evolved. But I don't think the old left versus right, rich versus poor is irrelevant. You know, I think that that sort of economic dimension of political conflict very much still exists. People were worried it disappeared, particularly in the Brexit days. Um, but those sort of cost of living prices brought that roaring back. Economic insecurity is very clearly a powerful predictor of voting behavior and political attitudes. So that still exists. The new thing is that we've got a second dimension across which politics is now competed on one. Um, it's not just a left right economic material debate, but it's also this cultural debate, this sort of wokeness or your attitudes to what should be taught at schools or whether or not we should have particular views to asylum seekers and minority ethnic people or gay people or trans people and so on. That's sort of that second dimension, which I'm not quite sure how to define, but there's, that's clearly different to the material dimension that politics is usually competed on. The importance of those two dimensions kind of comes and goes, depends on the world around us, right? At the moment, the economic one is more important. Maybe five years ago, Johnson and Brexit, the cultural one was clearly the dominant thing, right? People weren't talking about left and right. They were just talking about Brexit, not Brexit, and people wouldn't talk to each other. Basically, so the cost of living thing, I think, has basically brought the economic one back to the fore. The radical versus reactionary, I'm not quite sure how that matches on to what I've just said because i'm not quite clear where the radical politics is today like like yeah re uh, to be as radical as reality itself right that famous quote i think is spot on it's just not quite clear to me where the political offer for that is coming there isn't clear to me what who the radical party is maybe if you argue there's a factor in the tory party where the radical party i can maybe believe it but at the moment i think that there's not actually huge amounts of policy space between the three main parties at least there's some divisions, but it's not massive. So I think you can argue they're all radicals or they're all reactionaries, but it's not quite clear to me if the politics is comp competing on the sort of reactionary versus radical thing. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from Sarah Page, and that is that, um, do you think that years of repeatedly reassuring the UK electorate the, that the UK is the, is the first amongst equals in leading the world in all issues by successive governments has anaesthetized the voters in showing in, any interest in how the country's run or perhaps democratic issues. I mean, do we still believe that we are the mother of all parliaments and therefore the public is, is perhaps more reluctant to, to get involved in democratic reform issues? Yeah, I think that's quite a good point. I think there probably is something there, right? I think most people won't buy it if you say the UK isn't a democracy. That line doesn't work. You know, oh, we're so corrupt that actually we're an oligarchy, not a democracy. That doesn't resonate with people. Um, they don't think the democratic system is completely broken because they say they can sort of freedom of association, the freedom of speech, all these kind of basic things that people kind of associate with democracy exist in this country, right? That's not the same as the thing the democracy is working exactly how it should. And what's come up quite a lot is sort of democracy doesn't need completely reinventing, but it does need repair, right? That analogy of like, it's created in the Victorian times and we need to upgrade it to bring it into the 21st century. That's the kind of thing that resonates um, with the British public. So yes, we were the oldest democracy, but by the same time, that for me, we need the biggest upgrade, you know? Things are old and need reforming. That kind of thing we found works. So I think that matches up with other work that people in the sector have done. Um, maybe I'm not, you have done it yourselves, but I think, other people, the Electoral Reform Society, Consortium Foundation, have found similar things in their kind of work. So I think that's reassuring. And I think the sector can be sort of aligned on that way to frame sort of democratic upgrade. Thank you, Parth. I think we're probably coming now to the, la the last question, which sort of follows on from that is, um, I'm about to expand a bit on what you've just said. So where have people gone wrong in the past when talking about political or democratic reforms and how can we avoid similar pitfalls in the future? Mm, that's a really good question. OK, um, where have people gone wrong when talking about demo? So, I mean, the past 30 years is checkered with quite significant democratic reforms. Um, leaving the European Union, I think, is probably 
at the top of the list, but creation of devolved assemblies, the creation of the Supreme Court, the Friday Agreement, these are all quite significant constitutional reforms um, for better or for worse, right? So there's no obvious sort of way to sort of say what's gone wrong or what's gone right, because it sort of depends on how you view these issues and whether you think they're working or not. I think it's worth saying two things, maybe one on Brexit specifically and one on all the reforms I've said and all the other things that have happened um, and all the things that haven't happened, basically, when you look at them a few. And I think when you step back, they all seem, it seems quite piecemeal or patchwork. You know, those reforms I mentioned, Supreme Court and Brexit and Good Friday Agreement and devolved assemblies, they don't, it's not quite clear what ties them together. And that's almost a problem. I think a wave of democratic reform has to be united around a single principle, right? It has to be quite clear-eyed. You have to have a clear-eyed approach to constitutional reform and you know why you're doing it, for what purpose to shift power, right? Constitutional reform at its very simplest is a question of where power lies and should it lie elsewhere. Um, and broadly speaking, those reforms haven't really thought about that sort of power question. Um, if we organize it all around the principle of everyone should have equal influence in the policy making process, you probably end up with a different set of reforms than the ones we've had. They're not saying that they're important in themselves. Good Friday was a great example, right? Everyone basically agrees that was a fantastic achievement of the Blair administration. But when you take it as a whole, the constitutional reforms since that period of time don't quite make sense together. So that's probably the first thing I do. I try and develop a package of reforms that are orientated or focused around one lodestar or something that you think that you're orientating things around to and you want to shift the political and maybe even economic or other institutions around that lodestar. Um, so that's probably what I would take forward. And I think the next wave of democratic reform essentially needs to have that sort of clear eyed vision. Um, what exactly that is, I think, is in a whole debate and we can have a different chat about that. Um, and Brexit is probably a good example of a specific case study or something where democratic reform was a what a constitutional reform was pursued in a deceptive way, maybe not deceptive, but certainly in a populist way. I mean, maybe deceptive is fair, actually, because there was quite a lot of stuff that was actively misleading or statistical gymnastics um, to coerce people to certain positions, right? And that feels like the wrong way to do it. That's not quite what we mean when we want to activate public opinion. We want to mobilize people, but we don't want to mislead them. And maybe maybe Brexit didn't do that. I don't know, actually, because I'm kind of i going back and forth in terms of whether I think there were things that were misleading or not. But that I think there was clearly a politics of fear and anxiety, um, which is the sort of the populist approach almost, right? The sort of there are elites out there and they're acting against people. Um, and I think that's not the right approach to democratic reform. Populists are essentially a, a democratic reform vehicle, right? When they talk about their whole ideology is based on the people versus the elite. So they don't challenge the idea of democracy. They challenge the way in which democracy is organized. And they say, well, actually, well, they've got it wrong. We need to completely change how democracy is organized. And ironically, that new form of democracy is basically authoritarian, right? That's the big, that's the big problem here. Um, but that's how we should understand populism. I think what we need is a popular or what a thing a, approach to democratic reform that resonates with a lot of people in a way that populism clearly has but isn't about that kind of misleading politics of division that sows anxiety and deepens fear it's more about solidarity and things working for people as a whole um i don't know what that politics looks like but that's what i would suggest well, thank you, Carl. I think that's a very good uh, point to finish on the point of uh, how can we do, uh, develop progressive populism. So I think that's quite a big challenge for, for all of us. Um, so thank you very much, Path. I just wanted to mention for people who were uh, who'd asked questions about uh, sort of ethnic minority uh, or engagement with ethnic, ethnic minorities over de democratic reform issues. As part of Black History Month, we have a webinar on the 30th, which I hope many of the people on this call will want to join, where we've got uh, Shavna Begum from the Running Mead Trust speaking, uh, Lee Jasper, who some of you will know from London politics, former advisor to Ken Livingston, and Brian Wells, who will be joining us from the US, where we'll, we'll be discussing uh, how well are the UK's ethnic minorities served by UK democracy. So... I'd encourage people to join that. I think it's a, a good point to finish. Uh, thank you again, Path. I know how busy you are uh, with all the party conferences. Um, we are very fortunate to have you joining us. And uh, we appreciate the fact that you volunteered to undertake some research which might be helpful.
uh, to, to us as an organisation. So thank you, everyone. Apologies to anyone who had questions in the uh, Q&A that we didn't reach, but I think we've had a good, a good uh, range of questions asked, and I look forward to seeing many of you uh, out on the 30th. Thank you very much. Good night. Thanks, Amy.